Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. My name is Maureen Price, and I will be the moderator for our presentation and the leader for FLOR's Business Transformation and Innovation Team. We will focus on new and innovative ideas, never losing sight of the critical thinking and analysis that comes from our global team of expert engineers and designers. Our people are at the core of our success. Every one of the Innovation Builders team and the speakers on this call are all remote working parents and grandparents, and we applaud their ability to find the time to share their knowledge in addition to serving their clients while juggling the intersection of their career and home lives. As with the other webinars, this will be a technical presentation intended mainly for project and structural engineers who are interested in knowing more about the unique structural engineering considerations for projects that involve the reuse of and new loads to structures in existing facilities. These types of projects are called sustaining capital by some and small capital projects by others. Whatever you call them, reuse of existing structures is common across all projects and across all business lines. Many of the examples shown today will be from the energy and chemicals business line, but rest assured, the concepts presented apply to all of the business lines that FLOR serves. FLOR has a very strong safety-driven culture. As such, it is customary for us to start our meetings with a brief safety topic. I'd like to introduce Winta Abraham, a senior, senior structural engineer in FLOR's Southern California office. Winta has over 12 years of experience at FLOR and is an important member of our structural design team. Soft-spoken and quiet, efficient and organized, Winta also loves to hike with her kids on the trails near her home on the weekends. Winta, please unmute your line. Thank you, Maureen. The safety topic I'll be presenting today is on emergency preparedness. As we all know, emergencies such as earthquakes and fires can happen anytime and anywhere. It could happen well, when we're at home or at work. And being that we've been focused on and living through a pandemic for a while now, these types of emergencies may catch us off guard. So for our safety, safety of our loved ones and our communities, it's always important to prepare for any type of emergencies that could affect us where we live, work, and visit. So here are some reminders and tips on how to do so. For emergency preparedness at work, the first step is to prepare a written plan specific to the work environment. So work environment could be job site or office environment. As a minimum, the plan should address means of communication, signals and alarms. It should include what everyone's actions and responsibilities are and evacuation routes, assembly points, and personal accounting. In addition to preparing, train and practice the plan with employees. For emergency preparedness at home, the same principles apply. Start by putting together a written family emergency plan, and the plan should include a communication plan, and this should address such items such as where to meet, how to communicate emergency contacts. The plan should also include evacuation plan in case we, we need to evacuate for the emergency that happened, and this should include where to go, how to get there, making sure that our, all our cars are ready and preparing vital documents that we will take with us. In addition to that, create an emergency supply kit for your home and car that should last at least three days. If we can prepare a, plan, uh, a kit that would last seven days, that's even better. And lastly, practice the plan with your family. So these were a few reminders to keep in mind and plan for to help us prepare for emergencies at work and at home. Thank you for listening, and I'm going to turn the presentation back to Maureen. Thank you, Winta. Our speakers today will be Rick Drake and Jennifer Mennett. Rick is a FLOR Senior Fellow with over 45 years of experience in the industry. He is a subject matter expert in the areas of earthquake design, wind loads, and structural steel design. He is on several code writing committees for the American Society of Civil Engineers, including ASCE 7, Design Loads for Structures. He is also on several code writing committees for the American Institute of Steel Construction, 
including AISC 341 seismic provisions for structures. If all that wasn't enough, Cal Poly Pomona University engineering students are lucky to learn from Rick each year. Jennifer is a floor senior design engineer with 13 years of experience in the design of industrial structures. Her work features earthquake design, wind loads, structural steel design, including very large modules, design of foundations, and complex evaluation of existing structures. Jennifer is also a veteran of the United States Navy nuclear program. After two years of intense training, she served as an electrician for four years aboard the aircraft carrier John C. Stennis. Before we get into the presentation, a couple of brief housekeeping reminders. The audio lines for all attendees have been muted to eliminate background noise. The session today is being recorded and will be stored in the United States. Please make use of the Q&A tab to ask any questions which should be addressed to all panelists. We invite dialogue and we'll pause about halfway through and again at the end to address any questions that come through the Q&A. We value your time and the webinar will not expend past the hour allocated. If Jennifer and Rick are not able to answer all questions during this session, a Q&A summary will be sent to all participants within a few days. With those items cleared, I'll ask Rick to unmute his audio and begin. Thank you, Marie. Good morning or good afternoon. Thank you for joining us today for what we hope will be an informative presentation. Much of FLIR's work involves new facilities or new units within existing facilities. In the United States, these new projects are subject to the requirements of the local building code. Most states have adopted the International Building Code, the IBC, sometimes with modifications. Despite the name, the International Building Code is an American building code. Although there is nothing preventing government authorities in other countries from adopting it as their legal requirements for buildings and structures. For example, the IBC has been adopted in Colombia, Saudi Arabia, the country of Georgia, Jamaica, Haiti, and the Cayman Islands. Design lateral loads for new structures are specified in the IBC and its reference documents, and they are very site-specific. The IBC requires that wind and earthquake design loads be determined in accordance with ASCE 7. The ASCE 7 wind design loads are based on geographic location and the surrounding topography. The wind design loads along the Gulf Coast are much greater than the wind design loads along the West Coast. Similarly, the ASE 7 earthquake design loads are based on geographic location and supporting soil. The earthquake design loads along the West Coast are much greater than the earthquake design loads along the Gulf Coast. These differences in site-specific lateral loads are one reason why design for one project location cannot be readily used at another project location. Some of Fleur's work involves revamping of existing facilities, the topic today. These sustaining capital projects often involve addition to existing structures, such as pipe racks or coker structures. These additions are subject to the legal requirements of another local building code, the International Existing Building Code. Most states have adopted the International Existing Building Code, the IEBC, sometimes with modifications. Now let's highlight the IEBC requirements that apply for our existing structures. The IEBC requires that any element or portion of the structure that sees an increase in gravity loads of more than 5% due to the re revamp project must be strengthened. The structural elements in typical industrial structures include beams, columns, braces, connections, anchor bolts, and foundations. The graphic shows an example pipe rack from the Floor New Engineers training course. It's a small pipe rack, but suitable for training and also suitable to demonstrate building code issues today. Only the structural elements that see an increase in gravity loads must be strengthened to current IBC code requirements. As an example, let's add some revamp piping to our training pipe rack. 
the added piping is shown in red. We analyzed the rack both in its pre-project condition and with the added piping. In this example, we find that the beams and their end connections supporting the new pipes see an increase of gravity load of more than 5%. These beams and their end connections need to be strengthened to meet current IBC requirements. We find that the columns, out-of-plane braces, anchor bolts, and foundations do not see an increase in gravity loads of more than 5%. Therefore, they do not need to be strengthened in this example. In addition to gravity load requirements, the IEBC requires that any addition to an existing structure requires that the entire structure must meet the current IBC wind and earthquake design load requirements. That is a tall order for a structure that may have been built before we were born and was originally designed to much less stringent building code requirements. Fortunately, the IEBC provides an exception that permits us to accept without strengthening individual elements of the structure whose demand capacity ratio or safety factor has not increased by more than 10% since original construction. In its simplest form, a demand capacity ratio can be thought of as the magnitude of load on an element divided by the load it can safely support. Meeting this IEBC exception is a primary goal for any sustaining capital project. We all recognize that the cost to a project of structural engineering evaluation is much less than the cost of modifying an entire existing structure. Only the structural elements that see an increase in wind or earthquake demand capacity ratio must be strengthened to current IBC requirements. As an example, Let's look at what happens when we added the revamp piping to our training pipe rack. The added gravity load increased the seismic weight and also the seismic loads. We now analyze the rack both in its original condition and with the added piping for seismic loads. We find that the beams and their end connections, columns, and out-of-plane braces see an increase in demand capacity ratio of more than 10% in this example. The beams and their end connections columns and out-of-plane braces need to be strengthened to meet current IBC requirements. We go on and find that the anchor bolts and foundations do not see an increase in demand capacity ratio of more than 10%. Fortunately, they do not need to be strengthened in this example. We must keep in mind that the IEBC requirements for the existing structure require that the original construction of the structure must be identified. This often requires a search of the owner's physical or electronic vault. The older the structure is, the less likely that the original construction drawings can be found. In some cases, the structural engineer may have to find the oldest drawings available for the structure and work backwards based on information and photos obtained during a site visit. The site visit is also useful in identifying previous additions to the structure. As Jennifer will show us later, all additions to a structure may not have been designed by a structural engineer. Some may have been creatively added by other trades. One thing that we often find is that previous additions already caused parts of the structure to exceed the 10% threshold. To evaluate an existing structure, we need to make three finite element models to represent the different points in time in the life of the structure. We will illustrate the models with this coke drum structure. Model one is the original construction. If a structure had been previously upgraded to the current building code at the time of the upgrade, we would consider that to meet the IBC intent for original construction. So this is why we would need all those drawings to help us identify things. Model two is the original construction plus previous additions. We have added the previous additions to our coke drum structure in red. We must include in our finite element model any weight additions since original construction, such as heavier piping or equipment. Model three is the original construction plus previous additions, plus project additions, plus proposed structural strengthening. In this example, most of the project additions shown in green 
with the added weight of a number of motor-operated valves and 48-inch diameter piping, replacing much lighter manual valves. A number of small maintenance platforms and piping spring hanger supports were also added, as well as new structural bracing. The added weight near the top of the structure increased both the gravity and seismic design loads. Once we construct our three finite element models, we need to apply the current IBC loads to all three models. Members that meet the current IBC requirements in Model 3 are acceptable and do not require strengthening. Any remaining members that have seen an increase in gravity load of more than 5% between Models 2 and 3 must be strengthened to meet current IBC requirements. Any remaining members that have seen an increase in lateral load demand capacity ratio between models one and three must also be strengthened to meet current IBC requirements. It helps if you're really good with spreadsheets to keep track of all of the numbers and to make the required comparisons. Here is part of one tab of one of the many spreadsheets we developed to organize and summarize the calculations for the previous coke drum structure example. For this structure, the finite element models had over 1,700 members and 70 different load combinations to consider for each model. The 1968 model data represents finite element model one for the original construction. We used the spreadsheet to summarize the highest demand capacity ratio for each member, location of the member in the structure and the governing load combination that yielded the highest demand capacity ratio. The 2019 model data represents finite element model three for the revamp project with all additions since the original construction and the structural strengthening for this project. I will highlight three of the structural members on this spreadsheet to illustrate the calculations I've been talking about. Member M22, the line highlighted in yellow, had a demand capacity ratio of 0 0.742 in the original 1968 structure and 0 0.981 in the strengthened 2019 structure, an increase of 32%. Although the increase in demand capacity ratio is more than 10%, this member is okay because the 2019 DCR is less than one. It meets the current IBC requirements. Member M24, highlighted in orange, had a demand capacity ratio of 2.28 in the original 1968 structure and 1.817 in the strengthened 2019 structure, a decrease of 20%. Although the 2019 DCR is greater than 1.0, this member is okay because the strengthening decreased the DCR from the original construction. It meets the current IEDC requirements. Member M38A, the line highlighted in red, had a demand capacity ratio of 0 0.839 in the original 1968 structure and 1.103 in the strengthened 2019 structure, an increase of 11%. The 2019 demand capacity ratio is greater than one and the increase in demand capacity ratio since original construction is greater than 10%. Therefore, it does not meet the current IBC or IEBC requirements and is no good. I'll pause to let you appreciate the complexity of the analyses that must be performed. Rick. If I can interrupt you for a minute at this point, we have received a question that you might want to answer now. The question is, when in the project should this evaluation of existing structures be completed? That's a good question, Maureen, from one of the listeners. In my experience, the earlier the better. Let, let me be more specific about that. Each of our owners has their own gate process for funding a project. In the past, some floor projects, the first one or two phases of this gate process did not involve any structural engineering and any structural material costs were estimated based on historical factors. 
This proved to be problematic when in later phases we analyzed the existing structures involved and identified much higher material costs than had been previously estimated. We basically find that historical estimating factors are not very useful when every existing structural modification is really a one-of-a-kind structure. Where do we get these factors? As a result, I encourage structural engineering involvement early in a project to determine realistic material costs before the client has to put in their first major funding request. I think that answers that. Back to you, Maureen. Thank you, Rick. Please continue with your presentation. As our example spreadsheet shows, the evaluations required to demonstrate conformance with the legal requirements of the IEBC are not quick back of envelope calculations. The complexity of obtaining the information and making three finite element models of complex structures, subjecting these models to the current IBC loads, and then performing the spreadsheet comparison results takes both attention to detail and time. Evaluation of complex structures may take three months or more. The evaluation assumes that the existing structural members still have their original strength. This may not be a reasonable basis for structures that have existed for many years in a corrosive chemical or saltwater environment. A site walk may identify the need for a corrosion survey. To identify corroded members, a condition survey of key structural load-carrying members and their connections should occur early in a project, preferably before the finite element evaluations. As we find, better information early in the project supports more certainty in the total install cost estimates we provide for our clients. So in summary, we need to understand the legal requirements of both the IBC and IEBC, which apply in both United States jurisdictions. If we choose to add to an existing structure, we now own it. We now have the responsibility to provide, to prove that the structure with the project conditions meet the legal requirements of the IBC and IEBC. We need to consider the increase in gravity loads on individual structural elements. We need to consider the increase in lateral load demand capacity ratio on individual structural elements. Remember, we don't have to strengthen the entire structure, only the beams, columns, braces, connections, anchor bolts, and foundations that exceed the numeric limits of the IEBC. Now that we are all familiar with the legal requirements of the IBC and IEBC, I will turn over the presentation to Jennifer, who will present some examples to illustrate common IEBC applications in petrochemical and industrial facilities. Jennifer? Thank you, Rick, and good morning and good afternoon, listeners. What may seem to be an addition of a minimal load could require significant retrofit, removal of unused lines, or entirely new independent supports. Even a replacement in kind type project needs evaluation of the existing supports. Requirements for pipe, electrical building codes, and mechanical equipment also get updated to improve safety similar to the building codes. For the example of a pipe replacement, although the weight may not significantly change, there will be additional and or relocation of lateral restraints and possibly additional loops. Consequently, the supporting structures require evaluation for the change in loading. Once a project plans to reuse a structure or structures, the structural engineering discipline gets involved in evaluating the structure. Information gathering begins by obtaining the existing available drawings. Quite often, the historical drawings are missing. Usually, there are structural drawings of additions that will show existing structure information. The original construction versus later modifications and additions is determined and structural models made. If materials are known, such as concrete strength, material testing may be needed. The next step is to determine if the modifications upgraded the structure to the building code at the time of the modification. If the structure has been sufficiently upgraded, the clock resets and the upgraded structure can be considered original construction. 
A very insightful step in the evaluation process is a site visit. If a site visit is not possible, a detailed set of photos and laser scans can be used to get started with the evaluation. Quite often, there are additions that do not show up on the structural drawings, such as this example of, of extensive cable trace supports. These are additions that would have to be accounted for in the step two and step three models that Rick mentioned. In the case of pipe racks, there are quite often additions on top of additions. For example, the picture on the right has at least three additions on top of the column. Sometimes these additions already exceed the 5% gravity loading on the original structure before even considering any new loading. Typically, additions are either off to the side of the structure or a new level on top of the structure. This picture shows how additions are added to the side of the column. The available structural drawings may not show these additions. This is why a site visit is ideal to see the current loading on the structure. This picture shows that the structural engineer is not always contacted during construction. This is likely a modification made by a piping installation contractor. The structure appears to be a new installation, but has already been weakened. The structure already has a modification that weakens the column at a location where a lateral load is transferred to the column and very well could exceed the 10% demand capacity limit before any additional modifications could be considered. This is an example of structural modification. You will see the existing structure outlined in blue in the elevation view. Evidence of upgrades to meet the building code at the time of the modification are the addition of horizontal bracing, additional vertical bracing, plates added to columns and beams, reinforcement of connection, additional anchorage, and foundation modifications. If there is fireproofing, these modifications are typically only known if you have the available drawings. These type of reinforcements allow the structure to be considered original construction from the time these modifications were installed. Here's an example of a laser scan view of a buckled beam that was discovered during a site walk. Laser scans can reveal current loading and obvious damage, but depending on the quality, it can be difficult to see modifications. Quite often, the laser scan is done in black and white only since the data set can be quite large. Another option in addition to laser scan is 3D photographs. The views are distorted, but can help in discerning items in the laser scan. A site visit can reveal that a structure has already exceeded lateral demands. A buckled vertical brace and the anchor bolt concrete breakout failure shown in this slide are examples of structures that would not only require repair, but significant retrofit. These type of examples usually result in recommendations for installation of a new structure, since retrofit can be much more time consuming and costly for construction contractors. Here are two examples where repairs may be incorporated into the project cost instead of a maintenance budget. On the left is a concrete column that has falling where conduit is attached. The picture on the right shows corroded steel. The gusset plate for the vertical brace actually had holes in it that were in need of reinforcing. Evaluating a structure in an early project phase can help the budget for these type of repairs. After the information gathering part of the evaluation, which can be a very expensive part of the effort, the structural analysis can begin. The analysis can be as simple as this pipe rack load comparison. Typical cross sections are checked for original design, current loading, and with the future loading. If this analysis is performed early in a project prior to knowing future loading, 
the first two models can be compared to make some judgments on the current state of the structure. This is an example where extensive and time-consuming analysis was required. For this coke structure example, it was found that considerable retrofit was needed for the structure. The previous additions were already over the existing building code thresholds for the steel structure only. No modifications to the concrete or foundations were needed. This is a reactor structure that needed to be retrofit to accommodate a much heavier replacement reactor. The solutions for this structure were a steel frame was added underneath the concrete structure. This is an example where the entire structure, including foundation, needed retrofit. The foundation was extended by five feet all around. The concrete structure also had to be drilled through to fit new anchor bolts for the vessel and for a new platform on two sides. This is an example of a new compressor motor not fitting on an existing structure. The motor is to replace a steam turbine in order to improve steam balance within the unit. Due to limited pot space and need for continued operation, the structure needs to be reused. The structure will need to be extended to accommodate for the bigger equipment. Lack of plot space is a common issue in existing facilities and the need for continued operation. In this example, the proposed solution requires dynamic analysis to determine the feasibility of the solution. Dynamic analysis is another type of specialty analysis that can be time consuming. The project engineer, who also does structural engineering, identified the need for this analysis early in the project so that the estimate could be more accurate. When a structure is required to take on much larger weights and lateral loads, not only does the structure require modifications, but also the foundation usually requires retrofit. This is an example of an equipment structure that added a new level with new equipment and large piping valves. For this example, since there was not enough plot Space to install new piles. The adjacent foundations were tied together and made larger to make one large mat. More anchorage was also needed, which required a large pier and welding additional steel to strengthen the base plates and columns. When there's a lack of plot space and time constraints, this type of costly retrofit is needed. Retrofit is not necessarily a cost savings or the best solution. The ease of construction must be considered. A new support may actually be the least expensive option. A new support can sometimes be installed quicker than modifying an existing support. This foundation in this example needed significant and difficult to install modifications since management did not want a new foundation. The schedule contractor effort and material cost would have been less had a new support been installed next to this one. I'm going to turn the presentation back to Rick for questions and comments. Rick? Thank you, Jennifer. Before we go, let's check with Maureen to see what questions or comments we have received. Thanks, Rick. There's a lot of questions that have come in. The first question is on slide 21, and it's addressed to Rick. Can you please elaborate on member 24, where the 2019 model shows a DCR higher than one and does not need to be reinforced? Okay, that's a, that's a common question. Um, basically, the building code, uh, although we're, look, we're interested in life safety, we're also interested in the economic cost. So the building code would look in this situation and see that we've actually improved the situation for a member M24 from a demand capacity ratio of 2.28 to 1.817. And so they would say, well, that, that's good for life safety. But to make you feel more comfortable with that, you must realize that the lateral loads that are defined in ASE 7 are based on extreme low probability events. For example, the design earthquake that we designed for has a, has a 1 in 2,500 possibility or probability of occurring in any one particular year. 
So we're basically talking about a demand capacity ratio based on a highly improbable but possible earthquake. So we're kind of balancing probability with life safety with the owner's money. So if we can spend some money to improve the seismic performance of a structure, the code writers believe that's a good thing. Maureen? Okay, Rick, we've got another question for you. What is the reasoning that it is okay to accept a member with a DCR greater than one, even if the demand on the member was decreased? This also refers to slide 21. Uh, I may have already answered that question, but basically it goes to the, the philosophy behind the building code. The building code is a life safety code. It's designed to preserve or protect the life safety of the occupants in, in our examples today, industrial structures. The workers in the industrial structures are trained for safe safety, although most of the events that they're trained for are gonna be uh, operational upset. The other thing you need to understand besides, you know, where there's an economic balance here, the earthquake design, the demand capacity ratio greater than one doesn't mean that the structure is going to collapse. It really means that the structure, some part of that structure, in this case, member M24, would actually stretch or yield or deform. And so we now have a highly damaged structure, but it doesn't mean it's going to collapse. So as long as the structure is still standing, and we build the structures and detail the structures so they do have these deformation characteristics that the workers will be able to get out of the structure to safety should a big earthquake happen. I think that'll answer that question. Thank you, Rick. Um, now I have a general question that's addressed to Jennifer. I understand the impact of the 5% on existing structures, but if the foundation details are not known, how do you make that judgment? That's a good question. Uh, if you don't have uh, available information, uh, you need to have uh, additional field investigation. You'll have to do some excavation and probing, and that's to discover the extent of the foundations. Also, some concrete samples are taken to determine the material properties. This uh, additional investigation can delay the schedule for evaluating the foundation. So it is good if a facility can maintain their existing uh, drawings up to date and keep all, all the original construction drawings. Uh, Rick, is there anything you would like to add? Uh, yes, we, once we know the geometry of the foundation and of course the load on the foundation, it's good to also consult with the uh, geotechnical consultant for this particular location. And sometimes we can get an improvement on soil bearing, basically in the fact that the structure has been preloaded for X amount of years by the structure. So, so once we identify the, the geometry, if we can get an increase in the allowable soil bearing or pile loads from the geotech, that will also sometimes help us from not having to modify the, the uh, foundation. Marie? Thank you, Rick. The questions just keep pouring in. Um, this is another general question for you, Rick. How does our structural team handle a situation where a project is replacing an existing piece of equipment or pipe that doesn't increase the weight that's, that's there currently? So in other words, it's replacing in kind, but the existing structure is still not up to current codes. Basically, if we're replacing a piece of equipment in kind with a piece of equipment that's the same geometry and weighs the same or less, we're not required by either the International Building Code or the International Existing Building Code to modify that structure. Because we haven't, in the case of the International Existing Building Code, we haven't exceeded the increase in gravity load or increase in lateral demand capacity ratio threshold. Uh, if we do see, as responsible engineers, that the structure is really in bad shape or we do realize that it has very high demand capacity ratios, we will recommend to our client that they do some strengthening of the structure for safety standpoint, but that would be a voluntary strengthening in that case, not required by the code. 
Thank you, Rick. I have another um, question that's come through that I'll address to Jennifer first, and, and then you can follow on with. In scenarios where the existing as-built drawings and calculations are not available um, at the client's facility, do you have any specific recommendations on the approach which should be taken in such instances? Uh, for the case where uh, existing drawings are not available or the original construction, uh, field investigations have to be done to measure the structure. And again, like we, I mentioned before, with existing foundations, you have to find out uh, probing or exploratory excavation to figure out the dimensions. For steel structures, there could be fireproofing. You have to chip away at fireproofing and take measurements of the steel, uh, including at connections to see what the connections are. There's a lot of additional field investigation type work which can delay our evaluation. Rick, is there any more you would like to add on? Uh, yes, yes, Jennifer. There, there are some industry uh, sources that are useful also. For example, in the case of steel structures, if we can uh, measure the, uh, the, the, the dimensions on a W flange, for example, the, the flange thickness, flange width, et cetera, and we know about the time period that the structure was constructed, we can go to documents like AISC Design Guide 15, which basically is, is a collection of historical shapes and what years they were they were used and what their material strengths were at the time. There's also similar documents from ACI that can help give us insights as to the concrete strength and the corresponding uh, rebar strength that would have been likely in the time period that the structure was built. So we, we do want to draw on industry, industry guides to help us with that. Maureen? Thanks, Rick. I have another question for you. Can you please highlight the differences between the IEBC and the California Building Code requirements? In particular, level one, level two, and level three alterations? Uh, we've got a little bit of apples and oranges there. The, the International Building Code is adopted by the state of California to become the California Building Code with modifications for principally hospitals and schools. The international existing building code is modified by the California state again, and they call that the California existing building code, and they make modifications to the IEBC. One of the principal modifications that they make is the IEBC has three different methodologies for evaluating existing structures. One is pretty well what we were talking about, analyzing it for code loads. There's another methodology based on performance-based design, and uh, uh, there's, a, there's a third methodology that, that is just catching on. The state of California does not allow all three of those methodologies. They only allow the methodology that's based on the 5% and 10%. So hopefully that answers that question. Maureen, back to you. Uh, let's see. So many questions are filing in all at once. <laughs> okay. Um, here's, a, here's another general question that I will um, send to Jennifer first, and then you can, can tag on, Rick. Uh, Jennifer, do you have any tips or tricks for assessing existing connections under increased loading due to retrofit? These are often the limiting components on my projects, and the information is very difficult to obtain for existing structures. Okay, like I said before, you have to get the existing information for that connection. If uh, that's not available, you have to get a close-up view of that connection. Make sure there isn't any corrosive damage for any retrofit of it, whether there's, there's welding, adding stiffening plates. For more connections, you can add little braces underneath could be just a plate or uh, angle. Uh, Rick, would you like to add on? Uh, no, you, actually you did a pretty good job. There really is no silver bullet. We just, you know, if, if the what's there doesn't meet the loads, then you're going to have to add something to the connection primarily, you know, whether it be 
stiffener plates or or saddles or welding the connection shut, uh, possibly drilling additional bolts or changing out the bolts and put higher strength bolts. But basically, you're, you, you're, you've got to operate with your strengthening in, in accordance with the appropriate codes. And there's the same type of thought process with, with the concrete. Concrete connections are a little bit different. Uh, it's hard, harder to modify, but sometimes you can modify a concrete connection by adding fiber wrap material to the outside, which essentially is like adding reinforcing steel to the outside. But basically, our, our tips and tricks are we've got to conform to the building codes, the material codes. Back to you, Marie. Thanks, Rick. Here's another general question. Um, I imagine that there's various different uh, software packages available for FEA. Um, are there variances in the magnitudes of the loads based on the different software packages for the FEA analysis that you spoke about? Uh, well, we primarily use two of them at FLUR. We use RESA and we use SAP. And I'm not, I'm not an expert on the structural dynamics, but I do understand that their, their eigenvalue solutions for the earthquake loads are slightly different and it would give slightly different results, but they're not significant enough to make a difference in if I use this software, I don't have to modify the structure. If I use this one, I do. Uh, I think they're, they're similar enough. They're both following the same mathematics and structural dynamic principles, just slight differences in programming, but I don't, I don't see any difference in results between the different software. And I would assume the other software that I haven't used recently, like eTabs, and I don't want to leave anybody out, but I assume that they're all going to give similar answers uh, to the same mathematical model. They'll, of course, tell you that theirs is better. But Jennifer, do you have anything to add to that? Uh, no, I think you're you're correct on if you're making a mathematical model and if you're comparing apples to apples, it should come out with a very similar result. All right. Thank you. I hope you're not tired of answering questions because they're still rolling in. I have another question for Jennifer. If the initial design under the old code already considered future loads, then, year, then years after added additional loads, does IEBC requirement still, is it still applicable for this case? Um, if you have that documentation that says the structure has been uh, planned on having like an additional level, you still want to do a, a check to make sure what you are adding is within what was planned on in the future. So there's still some evaluation that needs to be done, but your chances are, are good that, that adding additional level is is going to be acceptable, especially the foundation has already planned on that additional loading. Rick, uh, do you have anything to add? Uh, just that it, it's fairly common with pipe racks where a, a pipe rack may have been initially designed for a, a load on each level of 40 pounds per square foot or 25 pounds per square foot. However, the initial loading might have been considerably less and if there's room in the rack uh, physically to put in new pipes, uh, it's, it's relatively common to take advantage of the fact that the pipe rack was originally designed for a higher load. Now, that may not be on the original structural drawings that we can find them, so sometimes what we have to do is we've done, we've done some reverse engineering on some pipe racks to conclude what the original engineering load was and then demonstrated to our satisfaction and to the building department's satisfaction that the new the new loading was within the original design, in which case the modific we're not required to modify the structure. Maureen? All right. Here's another question for you, Rick. How do you define the need for fireproofing on new or modified structural members? Do you replicate what was there before, or is a new fire assessment required? Uh, that depends. The the initial fireproofing requirement is usually because of uh, process reasons, which you would probably be able to answer better than me. But basically, is there a fire source that can reach reach the uh, load carrying the gravity load carrying members of the structure? 
uh, it's possible that when we're adding to a, a new structure that we can ask the client to make a new evaluation. Maybe the piece of equipment that was the source of the fire isn't there anymore. Uh, maybe the evaluation techniques are different. But it really, it really boils down to a non-structural decision as to whether the structural additions need to be fireproofed. And we have to work with our, our client uh, and our fire protection experts at FLUR to, uh, to come to that conclusion. All right. Okay, I've got another question. Let's start with Jennifer on this one. Jennifer, how do we take account of the corrosion in the reinforcement while doing the retrofitting of the foundation? If uh, corrosion is evident, uh, you'll see falling of the concrete and rust. You'll have to, if the corrosion is not too bad, you clear away the concrete past the reinforcement and you, you can replace in kind. If not, you need to reinforce that foundation or concrete structure, which may include extending and make it larger and you have new reinforcement, or you, there's fiber wrap options. Uh, Rick, do you have anything to add on this? Uh, not really. Uh, the good news is foundations usually aren't where we get corrosion because they've been buried in, in the ground. They don't have the constant source of, of water and air at the same time. But we basically, similar problems when concrete is corroded above ground. It's usually pretty visible. Steel that's corroded expands and it tends to fall off the concrete, and it's just it's there's no silver bullet on, on replacing that. Uh, it, you just have to identify the extent of the damage and somehow either replace it or uh, strengthen the structure externally. Marie, all right. Here's another one. When analyzing the original construction, what code do you consider? for determining the DCR, the current code, the current code or an old one? Strictly speaking, the IEBC lets you analyze it to either the original or the current code. We prefer to do the analysis of all three models with the current code because that helps us, especially with model three, identifying members that meet the current code. So for the purpose of the comparison, as long as you have apples and apples, you're okay. But we find it's it's most practical to use the current code to to meet all of the requirements. So the comparison can be done with different codes, but to meet all of the requirements, the current code is the way we should be going. Jennifer, would you like to add anything to that? I agree. Sometimes I have checked to the original code to see if this, how the structure behaved, if everything was working under that that code, that original construction. Uh, quite often I find that the lateral load is 10% of what it is now. So that explains why the structure was okay at the time. Uh, but under the current code, it, it fails miserably. That's, I've just done it just for just curiosity and, and uh, to see where, if there's any areas that are obvious that can be improved. Thanks, Jennifer. I have another question in for you. While checking the lateral loads, is it only lateral load or does it need to be a combination of loads with the gravity load? It is a load combination per the International Building Code. So the building code has a prescriptive uh, load combinations that include dead load and combinations with live load wind load and seismic load, they're never combined when it's seismic. Um, and we also have thermal loads in, in the case of pipeways and equipment. So they're, they're always combined with the gravity load. Uh, does that answer the question? Rick is the expert on load combinations. <laughs> uh, well, base, basically, uh... I had mentioned that we had, under my example, over 70 load combinations. There's quite a lot of load combinations in the International Building Code. Uh, and then we have to apply the wind load in four different directions and the earthquake loads in four different directions and the earthquake loads up and down. And then we have unique loads in some of our petrochemical industries. But to simplify the answer, 
uh, gravity loads are always on the structure. So we can analyze that some of the load combinations do address just gravity loads alone, like the dead loads, the live loads, snow loads. Lateral loads always occur on a structure that has gravity loads. So anytime you're talking about wind or earthquake, it's always in combination with, with gravity loads to get our, our demand capacity ratio. Back to you, Marine. Thanks, Rick. And that's all the time we have for questions today. I want to thank Rick, Jennifer, and my behind the scenes Q&A assistant, Linta, for the time spent preparing for this webinar. We really appreciate all who attended today. It's been a pleasure being your moderator. We will be hosting our next webinar on Thursday, August 20th at 10 a.m. Central Standard Time to discuss the International Construction Measurement Standards, ICMS. In this webinar, Floor Fellow Roy Howes will talk about the evolution of the ICMS standards and the need to have consistently and transparently benchmark costs to ensure that properly informed decisions are made and that the data can be used with confidence for project financing, investment, program, and decision-making purposes. Keep in touch with your floor contacts, follow our social media postings, or head to the Innovation Builders page on floor.com to sign up for future webinars. We appreciate your attention and thank you again for dialing in today. We will send out a compiled list of the Q&As within a few days. Expect to see a social media post in the middle of next week, which will indicate when the recording is posted on floor.com. If you have any questions at all or require additional information, please email innovationbuilders at floor.com and someone from our team will get back with you. Thank you very much and have a safe day.